right. Grab your Bibles, if you will. We are going to be wrapping up our biblical history of worship. Uh, and as we go into this, I, I hope that if you were here last week, uh, you got one of those yellow slips that probably the ushers were forcing into your hand on your way in. Um, your, your homework last week was to be praying, God, what do you want my part to be? And we've been looking at this thing that God has called us to, the thing he has made us to be part of, that is relationship with him. God himself is relationship. He has shown us how to be in relationship rightly with him. One of the ways we do that is through worship. And as we've gone over the course of the last nine weeks, we have looked at the fact that really from a biblical point of view, worship is every single aspect of our lives. The Moonies get to worship God as they raise their kids, as they dedicate themselves to that. That is an act of worship when it is done in the name of Jesus Christ and for His glory. It's not just when we come in here and we have some guitars and all that kind of stuff. It is when we are every single day giving our life back to Jesus Christ. That is biblical worship. And we looked last week at the fact that as God has walked us through the process. As God is the creator of all things, as he is the provider of all things, he has also called us to be like him in that kind of generosity. And so as we go through, we've been talking about this, and we talked a little bit last week, and we're going to get specific this week. I've given you that card. I'm going to reference it right now so you know what in the world that thing is. That is our faith promise commitment card. If you're not part of this church, wad it up and throw it away unless you want to be part of this, because what this is, this is the way that we, once a year, commit that we're going to take care of the missionaries that we have sent out of this country to go to other countries. Why in the world would we do such a thing? We're actually going to read about that today. But I don't know if you know this, but it's not free to live outside of the United States. I know there are some that want it to be free to live inside the United States, but the reality is that everything costs money. And as We join God in doing the work of his mission and accomplishing that mission. He has blessed us in so many ways over and over and over again. And when we get our mind right with him, we also get our schedules right with him. We get our energy levels right with him. That where we put our energy is something that honors him. And where we put our finance is something that honors him as well. And so today we're going to be taking some time, and before you leave, I hope that you will put your name on there and say, you know what, over the course of the next year, I'm going to commit this amount of money to support the missionaries that are doing God's work in places I may never go. And if you're offended by that, that's okay. You can sit where you're at and be offended, and I will be okay with you being offended. I won't be offended by you being offended, and you're welcome. But if you are wanting to say, God, what is it that you're asking of me? Then engage with this. And even if not, I do want you to get engaged with this passage because we did talk last week about significance. What is the most significant thing you can do with your day is the question I want you asking on a regular basis. As you are raising your kids, I hope you are praying, God, show them the significance that you want in their lives. Is it the most significant thing in the world to get really good grades or to be the best athlete or to whatever, drive the best car? Is that the most significant thing I could possibly do with the energy that God has given me, with the time that God has given me, with the smarts or lack thereof that God has given me, and with the money that God has placed in my care? What is the most significant thing I can can do with that? That's what we talked about last week. And sometimes I think it's, it's very difficult to identify that which will be significant if we don't keep in mind the ends to which we are progressing. If we are measuring ourselves against the rest of the world, then it becomes very kind of boring, I think, and simple, at least simple-minded, to say all I have to do is compare myself to the people around me to see whether I'm doing well or not. Do I have the amount of stuff the people in the house next to me have? Is my house bigger or smaller? Then That is super mundane, in my opinion. And from a biblical point of view, absolutely useless. Now, does that mean that those things are evil? No, it does not. Does it mean that having stuff is a bad thing? It does not. 
I'm not up here today to tell you, you need to sell all your possessions. No, I, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, though, what is the most significant thing? And it's hard to understand significance if we don't have in mind the end game that God has in mind. Do you think that God gave you the breath of life to just get that next thing that's on your checklist of, like, your big Christmas. And I think we all kind of understand that we do spoil our kids a little bit at Christmas time, but my goodness, if our mind is not right and we don't have the ends in mind, all we're really living for is our own Christmas list that may not happen at Christmas. It may happen come tax season. It may happen whenever I get that next raise. It may happen whenever I move from this job to the next job. Because then I'll get what I want. Is that significance? Is that what God has called us to? I don't think so. Jesus knew it was hard for us because we get so focused on the immediate necessities of life. He knew that, and so he spoke even to his disciples. And it's amazing to me that his disciples heard the words we're going to read today before Jesus went through everything that Jesus went through. And they even asked him some pretty Good questions, maybe, but I think they still missed it. But they, later on, after Jesus had done all the amazing stuff of, you know, dying and raising from the dead and, and being victorious over sin and death, then they remembered what he said, and they, they record this for us, and we're going to jump in. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 through 31 is where we're going to be today. If you have your Bible, open it up to that. If you don't have your Bible and you have your phone, uh, open up the app. You can get there that way. But we're going to be dealing with the ends, and maybe this isn't something that you're comfortable with. Once again, I don't care. I want you to understand what's in the Bible. I want you to know what's there. I want you to be able to wrestle with it. If you disagree with it, then be comfortable being wrong. It's okay. But know what's there at least to know whether you agree with it or not. This is not just some list of like, postcard greeting encouragements for your day that's not what the bible is while there is encouragement in there there's stuff in there that happens to share with us what ends god is going to bring this whole thing to what is jesus moving us towards why is he moving us in that direction how will you join him in making that a reality. These are the questions I really do want you wrestling with, not just today because it's Faith Promise Sunday and we're making commitments today that over the next year, above and beyond my tithing, above and beyond whatever regular giving that I do, I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice maybe in this area of my life so that I can make sure that somebody who's in another country sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with people I may never see, I want to make sure that they can do that job. That's what we're committing to today. Why? Why would you commit to doing something like that that will never benefit you? It's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. Man, you guys are sharp today. Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 1, it says this. As Jesus was leaving... Now, listen. I've told you guys before, I see humor in Scripture all the way through. I look at it from different points of view. I know God has made my brain very strangely... And I like to look at Scripture maybe in ways that other people may not get immediately. And so I try to share that with you and maybe make you giggle a little bit as well. But this passage has got to be one that Jesus is like, who are you people? And he's talking to his disciples. Let's read what it says. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. Does that strike anybody as a little odd? That's a little bit like taking an engineer who designs engines to the hood of your car and saying to that engineer, this is the starter. That's the alternator. And that engineer's like, do you, do you not see my name like literally stamped into the side of that thing? The disciples are pointing out the various buildings in the temple. Like, if I'm Jesus, I'm walking through going, got it, right. Um, you know, I told Moses about how to build the tabernacle. I told Solomon what was required 
to put this thing up, right? Like, I designed this thing in your point. Cool, good, I'm glad. You know, I mean, if, my, if I teach my kids about engines and go through, I, I do, I'm not going to like laugh at them when they go through and like, this is the alternator. Great, good job. So maybe there's a little bit of encouragement. Maybe Jesus is like, I'm proud of you, disciples. You were fishermen, and now you know what parts of the temple. Great. I don't know. But to me, this is just a little bit interesting. <laughs> so he changes the, the subject. But he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth. They will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of it, another. I mean, they're just thinking they're big stuff because they can point out to Jesus what the different ones are. And Jesus is looking at this thing and he sees it from beginning to end. And I'm not talking beginning to end like of the day. I'm talking beginning to end of its entire existence. And Jesus is like, good job. That's, yep, that's where they keep the grain offerings. Excellent. You know, that part's going to get destroyed completely. Like, it'll be gone. Because he is seeing this in not a limited... You guys do get that we see time only in the exact present moment in which we find ourselves. We can kind of think back a little bit and have this hazy recollection of the past, but it's only from your point of view. Jesus sees this place, the temple, from an eternal point of view and is saying to them something that probably ought to be melting their minds. And this kind of highlights for me something that I, I do want to like make notice or take notice of for you and, and make a note on. So number one is this. There is a difference between what you know and what he knows. So when you are evaluating how am I significant for God, understand there's a huge difference between what you know and what he knows. You may wrestle with this. I've had conversations with my brother. If Some of you may not know my brother. Uh, he and his wife, Erica. Erica's now the pastor up at a, a church in Tucson. And uh, his, their daughter is actually running sound for us today. Hi, Mariah. She's my niece. Um, she's awesome. You can hug her later. Um, but, uh, I mean, my dad was a pastor. I'm a pastor. My great-grandpa Eddie and my grandpa Eddie were pastors and I know, because I've had conversations with my brother on this, that is my significance being an engineer, because he's an engineer at Raytheon. Is that, is that what God has called me to be and do, and that's the end all of everything? And I know, because I've had multiple conversations with no, that is not the end all of his significance. Is my significance that I am a pastor, and that's a super spiritual thing. No. There's something beyond just what we do and the service we might provide for other people or maybe even for God that is more significant than how we view ourselves. There were moments in my life where I defined myself by the athletics in which I was engaged. And my view of myself was based on my success or failure in that field of athletics. Which, by the way, usually led to a lot of failure in my view of myself (laughs) because I wasn't that awesome at really anything. And so that was me wrestling, though, with, man, if my significance is this thing and I'm bad at it, then I am no good. What use am I? to other people, what use am I to my brother and my sister, what use am I to my parents or anybody else, what use could I possibly be to God if my significance is tied up in this? And that is the difference between what I know and what God knows. Because what God knows is that he has a plan for every single one of us. And his plan is not just some minor little piddly thing. It's a plan that you will have a direct influence on the eternity of others. That's real significance. And it doesn't matter what your job is. The influence that you have on someone else's eternity because you understand that there is an end to which all of this is heading. And maybe the decisions I make today, the conversations I have today, 
ought to be had with that end in mind. And maybe I need to get my head wrapped around what God knows, not just what I know. Verse 3 says this, Later Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us when all this will happen. What sign will signal your return in the end of the world? Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. I don't know if you've ever read that passage before. I don't know if you've ever studied in that passage. I don't know if you've spent any time there. But this has always been a passage for me, especially early on in my Christian walk, that just scared me. Will I know whether somebody is or is not the Messiah when they come claiming to be the Messiah? God, I don't, I don't want to be deceived. I mean, I, I, I might have gone bald just thinking about that. That's not how it happened. But, I mean, I have significantly in my growth, in my spiritual life, wrestled with this passage and been afraid. And now, listen, there is no need for fear when we know Jesus intimately. Did you know that Jesus said all the things that are in this passage? If you didn't, then maybe we need to get back in our Bible and read through what he said, who he is, what he did, what he accomplished on your behalf. I want you to know the things that are available in Scripture to know. I want you to know more than that, though. Because I know this, that Jesus wants specifically to reveal himself to every single person. He wants to have conversations with you. He wants to speak with you. He wants you to close your mouth long enough to learn to hear his voice. So that when somebody who is not him says, I'm Jesus, I'm the Messiah, you go, (laughs) no, you're not the one I know. I know the God I serve. I know what it is that he has asked of me. I know what his ends are because he's told me. But it is scary to me as a pastor to know this, that there might be people even in this room that might be deceived by those who say, I'm the Messiah, come follow me. And that's not Jesus. We need to know Jesus intimately. Verse 6 says, And you will hear of wars and threats of war, but don't panic. By the way, if you ever turn a TV on, just like memorize those last three words, okay? There's always wars and rumors of wars. Don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nations will go to war against nation. And kingdom against kingdom, there will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains, with more to come. Then you'll be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. There's, I don't know if it's just how God made my head, but when I read Scripture and I see Jesus saying these things in my mind, I just envision him kind of like staring off because he is seeing the future and just describing it in words. He is seeing these wars happen. He is seeing false prophets come and go. He is seeing earthquakes and he's saying, don't worry about all that. Don't worry about the fact that you'll be persecuted because of me. Endure to the end. Hold fast. Love me truly as I truly love you (sighs) 
and you'll be saved. And verse 14 is one that, to me, is not just some kind of sentence that was thrown in. It is something that says, this is our part to play. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. See, we happen to live in a community, I don't know if you've actually been here very long, many of you, some of you have. This is a high turnover community. We've got a lot of Air Force here, we've got a lot of Border Patrol here, we've got a lot of Raytheon here, we've got a lot of many other jobs here. But we are in a high turnover community. What does that mean? Well, Pastor, it means that it's very hard to have long-term consistent blah, 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 whatever. Uh, that's all, all true. You know what I think it means? I think it means this, that we as a church are uniquely positioned by God to train people so that when they leave from this place, they are ready to take the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the world, wherever God happens to take them. Maybe it's you next that are going. I don't want any of you to leave, by the way. I'm not like preaching you out of here. Please don't. But if it happens that your job takes you somewhere else, please understand that it is God's time right now training you so that when you go from this place, when you leave your small group that you happen to be a part of in this church, when you are no longer part of coming here on Sunday morning, that you take what you have learned here about Jesus Christ and you go to the rest of the world, whether that's inside the United States or outside the United States, I don't care. You take what you have learned and you preach it with your life everywhere you go. I think we are specifically positioned by God for that. And I gotta confess that there's times I get a little frustrated with that. It's like, God, I just spent like two years discipling that person and you just stole them. No, I didn't steal them. I took them somewhere else so they could share the good news over that place. This is not your kingdom, f farmer. This is my kingdom. Yes, you're right, Jesus. Sorry, my bad. Pulling my head out. Thank you. Needed that little smackdown. But we are, we are... We have opportunity to grow together here and to reach our community here so that if you do leave from this place, maybe you live here and die here, that's wonderful, then take the good news to your workplace here. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. See, what I have for number three is this. Become part of this future. If we're talking about significance with the end in mind, then understand that I don't want the end to come quickly unless everybody has had an opportunity to make a decision about Jesus Christ. I don't want the end to come quickly knowing that there might be somebody in this room who has not yet made Jesus the Lord of their life and accepted the forgiveness that he has offered through his death and resurrection. And then taken that good news to somebody else in their family that doesn't. I don't want the end to come yet, but I do want to live my life with the end in mind that, man, if the end is coming, then I have opportunity right now to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you don't want to share the good news of Jesus Christ, then you don't understand it. You have no clue how good it is to be redeemed from all of your garbage to the new life that God has for you. If you do know what that means, then there will be nothing in the world that can hold you back from talking about who Jesus is, about what he's done in your life about how he has transformed you and how that transformation wasn't just for you. It might be, hear that, is for everybody. We can become part of this future. Verse 15 says this, The day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. Reader, pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck of the roof must not go down in the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women. I mean, we could just stop right there. 
Is anyone alive still? Because that was a little funny. Any preg- Hello? Pregnant ladies, some of you really enjoy being pregnant, but I've seen it happen, that birth thing, right? That's not fun. Wow, okay, we're just going to keep going then. (laughs) How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. Number four is this, the time to join him is now. And pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for there will be greater anguish than at any other time. Time, any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive, but it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. So I have warned you about this ahead of time. So if someone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, don't bother to go and look. Or look, he's hiding here. Don't believe it. And number five is this, and again, I see Jesus just experiencing the future and speaking it to his disciples in this, and there's so much to unpack in here. But number five is this, don't fall in for mystery. Jesus isn't hiding. If somebody has some new fantastical theology, it's garbage. The theology we need is right here. If somebody has some amazing, oh, this person is just the most powerful person, garbage. Have I got a thing for you that will change? Garbage. Jesus is not hiding. We have an obligation to reveal him to the lives of the people around us in our life. Don't hide what God has done in you. What does that mean? It means this. If there was sin and brokenness in your past, don't bury it so nobody knows. Don't hide that stuff if that's something God has redeemed in you. Pastor, you want me to talk about my past? But I was a bad person. You know what that sounds like to me? A testimony. You mean that God changed you into the person I see today from a real dirt bag? That's what I mean. You're not just a good person because you try hard? No, <laughs> good grief, no. Anything that is good in me is a result of what Jesus Christ himself has done in me. If we hold back and hide our past so that nobody thinks ill of us, that means nobody will think about God. If we reveal our past, and how big a dirt bags we were maybe, and people see anything in us, that gives testimony to the fact when we open our mouth and say, if you see anything positive here, it's because of what Jesus has done. What do you mean what Jesus has done? He died for me. He took my sin, that old garbage, whatever it was, all the junk, all the bad thinking, all the absolute abuse of other people, all the manipulation, all the lies, all the looking at crud that ought not ever be looked at, all of that God redeemed me from and has set me free. I don't understand. Great. Let's keep talking about it. But don't fall in for mystery. Jesus is not hiding, and I don't want you to hide Jesus. 
if you are hurt today, I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus has healing for you. And that might take a little while. He might start it today. But you need to give testimony about what he's done. Because he is not hiding from you. I don't want you hiding him from someone else. Verse 27 says this, For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. What does that mean? It means this. You don't need to believe some weird person about, like there's some really cool guy that's out in the desert and whatever this talks about, literally. This guy sells this oil that does amazing things. That's great. You don't need to worry about that. You've got to understand that when Jesus comes back, no one will miss it. I don't know if you've been here for a monsoon yet. I know many of you have lived here for many years, and you have come, as I have, over the, man, it's been like 35 years since we moved here, 34 years since we moved here. I love everything about the monsoon. I love when it starts smelling like the monsoon. Everybody, I see some heads going, oh. If they could turn that into like a perfume and I could like douse my wife in that stuff, <laughs> I'd just be like, baby, you is gorgeous. That's like, that's the best smell in the whole world. And then it like it starts getting hot and sticky and even that, I'm like, coming and then you see like oh it's it's over no gallus come on come on come on come on and then you see things getting just super high and you're like oh oh yeah and then they start spreading out at the top and that's when you know Ooh! once it's hit the top and starts spreading out that's when it starts falling and then you can see oh my goodness veil is getting destroyed <laughs> and you're like Bring it over here. You want it. And when it does happen, you're just like, oh, like there's, I don't, I don't know if you have any traditions that are monsoon traditions. I will share with you the tradition that I have with my sons. First monsoon rain of every single year, we take our shirts off and run around in the streets. That's what we do. And they think I'm stupid and that's okay. But we do that. I love it. And everybody knows that once the lightning starts, oh, it's, the, it's the coolest thing in the world to watch. It's the dumbest thing in the world that I do, which is sit out like on the back porch where I can get struck by lightning and just watch it. I'm like, Jesus, if you want me today, rock on, let's do this. <laughs> But I just want to be out in that. And you cannot miss a monsoon. If it's happening, even over in Wilcox, you can almost see, oh, they're getting nailed. You, you can see that. That is just a small portion of what it will be like when Jesus Christ comes back. Nobody's going to be like, hey, what was that? No. <laughs> That's God. God is here. That is how obvious it will be. Jesus has said this to his disciples. As obvious as it is that you see the lightning and you see that flash everywhere, that is going to be what it's like when I come back. Just as the gathering of vultures show that there's a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will give no light, and the stars will fall from the skies, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a mighty blast of a trumpet. And they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. You see, he is coming again. So my question is this, will you be found busy about your own work or his? And this goes back to our question of significance. 
Are you busy doing things that are completely insignificant? Are you accomplishing things that are truly accomplishing nothing? Or are you spending your life, your energy, your finance, your time investing in things that are bringing about God's kingdom? Are you investing in things that let other people know about Jesus Christ? If you're not yet, have I got a deal for you? And we've got missionaries that we love that have been here from time to time. We don't ask them to come here very often because we want them kick and tail for Jesus where God has called them. And so we want them to stay where God has called them. But we want them to be able to stay there, which means that we want to make sure that they have the things they need, which is prayer and finance. And from time to time, they ask us, can you send a team to help? And I look forward to the day that we get to go and do that. We were actually looking with Thomas uh, Mojesus, by the way, if you weren't here last week, that's how you say uh, the couple on the left, their last name is Mojesus. It's good stuff. It's a great missionary name. What do you need? Mojesus. That's right. (laughs) They do a winter camp. They've been asking for help for that for years, and we want to be able to do that at some point. We're looking at next winter to be able to do that. But we want to make sure that they have the resources they need to continue to preach the good news of Jesus Christ in the places to which God has called them. If you're not going to go there and do that, then you get to pray and give so that they can. If God's asking you to, I'm not here to leverage you this morning. I'm here to give you an opportunity to say, what of significance can I invest in? And you have that card. I didn't bring one up here with me. Wave it. Somebody wave that yellow card around. Yes, I see two. Only two in this whole room. No, I think most of you have it, all right? You're going to like not walk out with that today. We're going to collect those today. So I do want you, if you can't do anything, Your call, but if God's asking you to, put your name on there, put how much you're going to do, that's between you and God, and let's continue to push the kingdom of God into the farthest corners of the world. This is one of the ways that we keep the end in mind, that we do significant things today that have an impact on the end. If you haven't ever done that before, and you're like, What does this mean? Maybe you need to re-listen to the whole thing that we've been talking about here. But you have an opportunity to take out of the blessing that God has given you to make sure that other people get to hear about who Jesus Christ is. People you may never go to. Okay? I want you to take advantage of that. I want you to step out in faith and say, God, I'm going to I'm going to do 5, 10, 15, whatever you can do. I'm not going to put that out there and say, you need to do this amount. No, you make that decision between you and God and say, you know what? Every week I'm going to do this, or every month I'm going to do this, or once a year I'm going to give X amount of dollars to make sure that God's message of who Jesus Christ is continues to go out to those who don't yet know Him. We're going to do that here locally as a body of believers. Absolutely. Absolutely but we've also been called to do that beyond our borders. So I want you to take the time that you have right now. I'm going to pray. The band's going to come back up. We're going to do one more song. A song, by the way, that I just realized we have not even practiced. (laughs) Not even a little bit. So if it's a disaster, it's totally on this guy right here. All right, so don't look badly on them. I don't even remember the chords to this song unless Dave puts them up right now. So, uh, But I do want you to be (laughs) filling that card out and give it to the usher. If you need, if you need one, uh, the ushers have them back here. If you don't have one of those cards, raise your hand, please. If you need one, the ushers are right here. They're going to give you one. If you need a pen, it's because we live in 2019 and we don't have any. Um, <laughs> no, we'll get you some. But uh, let's pray. God, you are good. Thank you, Lord, that we get to come into your house, that we get to see you. And what you know, which is far beyond what we know. 
So, Father, I pray that you will bend our hearts towards accomplishing your ends, the things that you want accomplished. Lord, we love you and we thank you. God, I pray that for those that are having this conversation with you right now, that, Lord, you would clarify for them that you are the provider, that you will take care of everything, and that, God, they are taking a step of faith to say, above and beyond anything else that I am giving, above and beyond my tithing, above and beyond my giving, I want to make sure that God's word goes out to the ends of the earth. And so I will sacrifice, trusting God that you're going to take care. So Lord, we dedicate ourselves that over the course of the next year, whatever we put on this card, Lord, we will sacrifice to you. We will invest in something that is significant beyond ourselves. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.